Good evening and welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event. Thank you for joining us online for this panel discussion where our topic will be modern conversations. Conversation plays a vital role in how we represent ourselves and come to understand our own identities. We have more ways to communicate with one another than ever before and from smartphones to social media, more of those conversations are taking place online. But is there more to this than a mere increase in communication? Do these different channels of communication change the nature of communication itself? And what might all this mean for our sense of self and our identity? In a period of pandemic in which we've watched many of the main parts of our lives move more wholly online, it's important to take stock of the impacts of such a digital transformation. Social media has often been something of a hobby horse for those lamenting certain kinds of social change in modernity. Is the time for us to push back against the idea that conversations and indeed lives conducted online are somehow less real or less worthy of equal weight? With the help of our panelists, we will look to see what philosophy, linguistics and anthropology can tell us about these distinctly modern conversations. So our speakers this evening are Alex Georgiakopoulou, who is Professor of Discourse Analysis and Social Linguistics at King's College London, Danny Miller, a Professor of Anthropology at University College London, and Rebecca Roach, Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at Royal Holloway, University of London. My name is Claire Moriarty. I'm an Irish Research Council Postdoctoral Fellow in Philosophy at Trinity College Dublin and a Fellow here at the Forum. So a quick note on the format, our events are usually split into about an hour of panel discussion and then 15 to 20 minutes of audience Q&A. It's possible to ask questions to our speakers and the way you do so depends on how you're watching this. If you're using Zoom, you can use the Q&A section of the interface and just type your question in there. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can pop your question in the comments section attached to the video and we'll be keeping an eye on them too. So uh, Alex, I'm gonna to come to you first. There's a way of thinking about storytelling as a practice, as a deeply traditional activity. But you've been looking at storytelling and self-presentation as they take place on social media. Can you tell us a bit about your study, what platforms you considered and what populations? Sure. Um, first, let me give you a little background. Let me say that I have a long-standing interest in what the stories we tell in everyday life reveal about ourselves and our identities and in particular, what the role of story sees in young adults' uh, lives and socialization. So when social media started saturating young people's lives, and that was over a decade plus ago, the first thing we noticed, and that was in a project with colleagues at King's College London, was that social media engagements actually shaped what 14 and 15-year-old pupils in a London comprehensive school that we were looking at talked about during the break and in class. So I specifically so how the stories they were telling were about what they had experienced when online, who they had talked to on MySpace, which is very popular at that point, and so on. So the new media was kind of genuinely uh, infiltrating uh, and shaping offline interactions. And, you know, subsequent to that, I started tracking in real time the provision by platforms such as Facebook to begin with of facilities for telling stories. It was very clear from the outset that the big platforms were very keen to provide users with storytelling facilities. Uh, obviously, they wanted to tap into the power of storytelling for connecting with others, making sense of the world, presenting ourselves. So tellingly, when Facebook introduced location facilities in 2010, which seems like a very long time ago, they specifically said that this was done so that users could tell better stories by locating their stories in specific physical places. Now, the skeptics amongst us, and with hindsight, can see how adding your location is a perfect vehicle for advertising, right? And marketing, okay. as well as for surveillance. And I think this is one thing that has fascinated me in tracking the development of storytelling facilities and how users work with them on social media, the hybrid status of these uh, facilities from the word go. They facilitate connections, relations, but at the same time, they quantify our data. And in terms of the environments that I have looked at, I started by showing how status updates on Facebook in the early days often included what I call in my work, small stories, brief, elliptical, often cryptic references to time, space, and characters and happenings. And these snippets of stories I found with audience engagement in comments 
frequently actually developed and led to much fuller stories. I then looked at how we share current affairs as stories, creatively reworking them with memes, for instance, on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, and I know we will talk about memes later on. And then with real-time tracking of the evolution of storytelling facilities, I looked at selfies on Facebook and then on Instagram. And that was through an ethnographic study of young women based in different parts of Europe, including London. Uh, and, and so I, rather than just being pictures, I showed how selfies told stories and generated storytelling, particularly the group selfies, which were far more frequent in my participants' posts than me solo selfies. And they told stories about outings, friendships, developing relationships, and so on. Finally, in the last five years, I have been studying stories as a distinct feature on major platforms. Now, this shift to actually designing stories and integrating them into the architecture of platforms started with Snapchat in 2014, continued with Instagram in 2016, Facebook followed suit 2017, Weibo and Red, the Chinese equivalent of Instagram, uh, have facilities for stories. Twitter fleets introduced in 2020 has an uncanny resemblance with stories as a feature. And of course, we have had the surge during the pandemic of TikTok short video forms, which seem like a natural successor of Instagram and Snapchat stories. And you know, sharing with stories has by now overtaken sharing through feeds they're a hugely popular feature uh, and they're widely replicated across platforms. So they kind of validate in a way my interest. Um, and I'm interrogating this stepping up in the design of storytelling facilities by platforms for the kinds of implications that it has, you know, for what types of stories, lives, experiences, subjectivities become visible and very widely available and what gets silenced, you know, what new genres of stories emerge what gets reconfigured, what design tools and functionality accompany these stories uh, and why. And also, and also, and I'll, I'll get to say a little more about this, I hope, uh, what do social media platforms themselves define as a story? You know, how do they use the term? Because they clearly use the term a lot. You know, how do they use it and uh, appropriate it even? And what is this doing to, as you said, conventional traditional modes of storytelling. Thanks so much. It's so interesting even to think about the contrast between what it might mean to choose to do a story over doing a feed post. I mean, it's only since I started thinking about your research that I've tried to think for myself about what, you know, what kind of difference I'm trying to invoke when I do one versus the other. So one of the themes of your results seem to be the centrality of the here and now uh, and that stories uh, are kind of a vehicle for sharing life in the moment. Um, would you mind saying a little bit more about how this, this shows up and how it impacts, especially sort of linguistic aspects of storytelling? Yeah, sure. And, 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 and again, uh, let me just, just by way of background, let me say that uh, I'm looking at stories online, not just in terms of what linguistic and, and obviously other semiotic resources uh, users uh, 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 deploy, but also in terms of how stories are shaped by the affordances of platforms. So what are affordances? Affordances are the platform's possibilities for specific types of action uh, and content by users, but also the constraints, right? And limitations that come with transposing a deeply traditional activity, as you said, away from face-to-face -face environments, in online environments. And in particular, I look at how major social media affordances, for example, uh, the portability of our content, their replicability, the fact that it can be amplified, uh, it can be scaled up, the fact that we can share stories on the go and document life as it's happening. How do these things affect the stories we tell? So the main connection I have identified between these affordances and the stories we tell is, is in that type of storytelling that has become quite normative on social media, which is really anchored onto the here and now, which I call sharing life in the moment. And if we look at this historically, it, we see early features and prompts, such as what are you doing right now on Facebook, uh, beginning to direct users to sharing their experiences in the here and now. And of course, 
Why do platforms like sharing life in the moment? Well, they do because it works really well with the algorithmic culture of timeliness and relevance of content and with a social media culture of breaking news. You're in a position to announce when something is happening. So sharing in the moment is primarily what we analysts call a platform directive. Term alert. What does this mean? Well, it means that, you know, if you think about it, platforms ask of us different things and some are obligatory. For instance, you know, you have to have a profile to have a Facebook account. Some are optional, but preferable. The way a platform and its algorithms are designed means that they prioritize, they push, they make more visible specific types of content at the expense of others. And in this way, platforms do not impose but nudges, right? Directors encourages towards posting specific content that algorithms like. You know, they create conditions of acceptance, uh, which is what happens with recent content that is liked by platforms because they want our attention, they want us posting often, they want us hooked and so on and so forth. So stories I have shown have very much been designed on the basis of this algorithmic logic of instant life sharing. And, and it's interesting, um, we compiled the corpus, that's a body of, of texts, in our case, online media and platform documents, blogs, launching documents about stories as a feature. And I analyzed that to see how a story is defined by the people who actually design stories on Instagram and Snapchat and so on. What lexical and thematic associations it has. And you know, I found that this word story was not associated, we linguists would say, did not collocate with the word past or with memories, as we have seen in other bodies of text. If you take the British National Corpus, for instance, and that's a hundred million words, uh, later part of the 20th century, spoken and written a text from a wide range of sources. And their stories collocate with remembering with the past. Now in our corpus, stories, the word story, stories was associated with the word moment. So, and, and, and of course the word moments and day were top keywords in our corpus. So stories very much are about sharing moments from your day, new day, new story. And this cycle of 24 hours, which is how long stories uh, on platforms last for, and then they disappear, unless you archive them. It's like the news cycle, if you think about it. Yesterday's news begins to fade away. So even in the design of stories, we see this close association with the present moment. And I, I looked at what actual users, what types of, of stories different users post, how they work with that logic, uh, primarily influencers on Instagram. And I found there too a distinct preference for stories that are well suited to sharing life in the moment. For instance, and all these are names that are recognizable by, by users online, breaking news, countdowns, behind the scenes, updates, good morning, good night stories. Um, if you think about these stories, there is a, a there's a kind of a, and the type of experience they share, there's a strong element of, 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 of storytelling, um, working a little bit like a diary of the everyday. There's an element of storytelling on the go in a lot of them. So you have the teller moving about with their phone, um, um, capturing snapshots of travels, everyday outings with friends, uh, their domestic environment. Um, a very intimate link between experiencing life and sharing it. And this conflation is really specific to the affordances of social media, um, which kind of prompt us to share as something is happening and then to update, very much in contrast to more conventional forms of storytelling, where you may tell a story about something that has happened, you may have had time to reflect on it. Um, it's, it's called, some people call it uh, advertising uh, um, companies call this type of storytelling snackable modular storytelling enough to fit the 10 seconds or so uh, of an Instagram story for instance or the characters of a tweet and one linguistic feature 
that I see. We don't see much in the way of language, right? And we'll talk about this. These are mainly visual, right? Photographic, multimodal video uh, activities. But we do see some language in the captions of these stories when they have them. And one linguistic feature that I see in those, look, I call them small stories of the everyday, uh, it is the prevalence of temporal markers of immediacy. So adverbs such as now, currently, today, um, little temporal phrases in 30 minutes, durative aspects of present tense verbs, for instance, visiting my friend, watching this, doing this, having dinner. And there doesn't seem to be any use of past tense in, in the captions. Uh, that I have uh, looked at. It's so interesting. It's like we're being sort of encouraged to broadcast a diary, you know, that and I feel like I noticed this first ironically, you know, when you're doing a, a story and you've got a particularly nice looking croissant or something in front of you and you, you take a yeah. picture and suddenly it's offering you breaking news. That seems very funny at first, but then suddenly, you know, maybe some of these kind of more temporal encouragements you're being given become part of your normal way of describing the sort of mundane elements of your life. It's so fascinating. Um, so uh, sort of, you sort of touched on it already, but another key theme seems to be the prominence of the visual. And I'm going to ask Danny to join us on this topic again in a, in a minute or two. But so, you know, when we think about traditional storytelling, we might naturally be thinking of manuscripts and oral traditions. But in the social media sphere, it seems like viewability is, is key. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what you found on this front? Again, I, I like uh, looking at social media in their historicity. And for the younger amongst you, uh, it may be hard to remember that actually big platforms such as Facebook and Twitter were in the early days very textual environments uh, filled with language. And the visuality of communication in general and storytelling in particular on these platforms really comes a bit later as part of the phase on social media, which I have called showing the moment. And this phase, to my mind, mainly involved the introduction of selfies, which became really popular from 2013 onwards. And what selfies did, they allowed, in terms of the stories, they allowed some key ingredients of storytelling, for instance, characters located in specific time and place to kind of become intertwined with the predominantly visual self-presentation. So the visual, in my view, is another media directive. Remember those? So if you think about it, visual posts and photographs in the early days, when they coexisted with textual posts, for instance, on Facebook, they were notably treated by algorithms as priority posts. So gradually users tend to visual posts to ensure visibility of their posts. And I actually show that in my work. I tracked specific individuals. Um, and how they shifted their practices on Facebook from the textual to the visual. And I compared younger and older users. Older users were late adopters of these visual features, but sure enough, they made the move. Um, and, and, and in fact, uh, now fast forward to nowadays and stories as a feature on platforms. And of course, we see the dominance of visual, photographic and video uh, posts and we're used to seeing them like that. As I said, the role of language tends to be confined in brief captions, uh, somehow recruited to provide some kind of an evaluative assessment of what is going on, but the visual or the video modality, they are routinely in the role of an unmediated raw depiction of the here and now. What this does for me, from the point of view again of storytelling and how we narrate and, 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 and how we present ourselves is it, 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 it presents, well, it affords the audience a kind of an eyewitness quality. You, you, you feel you're more there uh, with, with the visual stuff. Right? It's, a, the, it's a showing mode of narration, it's experience centered. And, um, it, it, and in fact, the visuals that, that the stories, uh, that accompany the stories often um, are what some analysts call uh, part of this amateur aesthetic. And this amateur aesthetic is, it, it builds on, if we think about it, vernacular style photographic uh, tropes. Image grain, for instance, we see that, we see unflattering posts, you know, ambient selfies, skewed composition. 
And, and such tropes have been long characterized as, we talked about a diary, this diaristic image making, which, which are, is very conducive to an authentic uh, presentation of self. And the last thing I'll say uh, about this, again, in terms of a linguistic point, in terms of our corpus, what our corpus showed is that, um, it, 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 again, as a noun, you know, the, the word story, stories collocated in our corpus with the verbs view and watch, while by comparison, it may not surprise you, in the British National Corpus, the verbs were tell and hear. So, and we see a whole language of visuality imported from TV, film viewing, you hide a story, a story disappears, you see a story and so on. Even the captions of stories, I said that they are made up of language, but they're also very visually arresting in terms of there's lots of emojis and what we call graphicons. You see big fonts, you see different colors, you see lots of exclamation marks, you see repetition of vowels to elongate a word. Now it may be a reflection of the data I have I recently been looking at from uh, influencers, as I said, said, female influencers on Instagram, but really the number of heart emojis I see in their stories, captions, possibly overtake any linguistic choice of a word. <laughs> And I shall leave you <laughs> with this point. Well, I, I think as well, the idea that the, the word story might be changing its primary meaning is fascinating. I mean, you look at these things from like, I remember the example of nice in the early modern period means kind of stupid and navel gazy. And it kind of seems amazing to me that we could have gotten to a place where it just means this kind of genial thing. But I wonder in, you know, 100 years, what people will associate with stories will listening around a campfire be completely gone. Um, so, Danny, the rise of the visual in new digital communications is also a major feature of your work. I know you also are a big expert on selfies, um, but to, to begin, would you mind telling us a bit about new visual communication in the digital era and how it shows up in, in your research? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Right. Good evening. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as really came out in the last set of uh, discussions that we've just heard, um, the visual is an extraordinarily uh, uh, novel and I think exciting element in the way communication and conversation is changing. And you do see it especially around, um, around social media. I mean, you think about, you know, how what photography used to be, you know, you had your analog photo and on some special occasion you take it. Now, photographs like any time, all the time. You've got all these kind of new genres, the, the meme, which didn't really exist before. Um, there is so much going on. Now, I'm going to sort of start talking really more as an anthropologist. I might get to something which maybe is a bit more philosophical later on. But um, as anthropologists, one of the things we're concerned with is we take a general point like that, this, this rise of all these visual media. But we also try and situate it in the different populations and understand it like locally in that context. So the sort of evidence base for what I'm speaking about, a couple of projects. Uh, one was a five year project called Why We Post about posting. Mm -hmm. And then the recent project is really about smartphone. Uh, we just produced a book called uh, The Global Smartphone. It's a free download from UCL Press, which summarizes a, a, a lot of this. And to get that information, each of us, and there, there were about 10 in one project and, and the same in the other, um, we go to a place and it can be Cameroon, Uganda, India, Brazil, Chile, Trinidad, wherever. And we simply stay there for 16 months, living in the community, listening, watching and seeing what's going on. And when you do that, collaboratively and comparatively, you start to see that we can make these claims about the visual, but it all depends where you are. So one of the books we did is called Visualizing Facebook. And essentially, it's a comparison between what people post in a village in England and what they post in a small settlement in Trinidad. So an example of this for you, Claire, um, what happens when somebody becomes a mother. Um, if you take the English site, when uh, somebody becomes a mother, typically, 
They have, of course, their profile picture on their Facebook account, which up until then was them, as you would expect. It's you, it's your profile, right? But a lot of these people in, in the English setting, um, soon after they've had the infant, actually, maybe first a mother with the infant, and then it's just the infant. Um, if it's not the infant, then it's the toddler. This may go on for a year or two. They've disappeared. The actual person is gone. They have displaced themselves with this image of their infant. That was in an English setting. What happens when you look at this in a Trinidadian setting? A Trinidadian woman who has become a mother will typically post images which are really glamorous, cool. Um, and what she is saying is, OK, I have become a mother, but do not think for one minute I am any less kind of out there and glamorous than I was before. So the point of the comparison is to say, um, Yes, we are very interested in this rise of the visual, but actually to, to understand it, you have to situate in each place. I mean, just to give sort of one more example, um, a lot depends, of course, on the traditions of the visual in that particular context. So if you look at our work currently in Japan, um, you find that Japan had a very conspicuous visual tradition. Um, you think of mango and year cards and all sorts of, of, of elements that were already there. So when the visual comes in, um, it's taken up in really interesting ways. Um, for example, we find a lot of stickers being used in, um, in correspondence. And we're not talking about young people here. We're talking about elderly people, elderly people showing care for each other at a distance. They can't be with you. They want to, to, to express that care. So they're, they're con constantly sending stickers because it's very easy. And often it's the, the amount of times you communicate with somebody rather than what you're actually saying that actually conveys that care. Um, or, I mean, one of the problems, you know, we, used to, we tend to think, oh, previous conversation was natural and this is less natural. But traditional um, communication in Japan was hedged around with so much etiquette, so many things and ways you could say it and you shouldn't say it and you're being careful, etc. In some ways, um, the use of the visual um, allows people to kind of relax a bit. It's a way people kind of deal with some of the nuances of, of, of those etiquettes and actually allows conversation to sometimes flow a bit more easily. Um, in some ways, you could say it's become the more natural compared to the sort of artifice that was traditional communication. So the overall point here is from the anthropological perspective, we're really trying to take these changes, but always with respect to a given population. Oh, that's fascinating. And I think it's not immediately obvious always why digital media would provide so many new ways to get insights into different cultures and different worlds. But I mean, just from what you said there, just so obvious that you know all of these complex aspects of different cultures are going to manifest themselves in the various ways people choose to engage and as well as you say sometimes it's very hard to figure out the right string of words to offer a hug to someone whereas if there's a little sticker that's just going to jump out and give them a hug you know how nice to not have to figure out the words and um, so I know you've talked a little bit as well about the the sort of possibilities of visual exchanges so how we might use the visual to communicate with each other in a kind of wordless way? Yes, I mean, if we think about it historically, um, visual has always been used in communication, but not actually in conversation. Conversation traditionally was essentially either oral, as I am speaking to you now, um, or text or in the email you might send me later. Um, those are the two modes. We didn't really have the same possibility of the visual. But when you start looking at a platform such as Snapchat, and I was also you know, looking at these kind of teenagers, et cetera, in, in school, um, they very soon found that they can have a conversation during the day. And all it is, is they're taking pictures of their facial expressions, you know, looking or hey, whatever, you know, um, don't stop that. Um, and um, by doing that, they express to each other in turn what they're feeling, what's going on, and it's a conversation. But that conversation had no words. It had no text. 
Um, it was simply visual images following one from the other. And I think, again, if you look at um, something that's, that's maybe not quite conversation, but what's going on in platforms like TikTok at the moment, um, you, what you find is that this is a, a, a platform where people um, send out a little video and then somebody responds to that by it's like a sort of sampling culture, you, you know, you, you use it, you quote it, but you shift it a bit, you make fun of it, or you make fun with it, and do something interesting. And then the person may come back on yours, and then sort of twist that around and do something, you may not even know each other particularly, but you are having something that is clearly in this sense, again, a, an unprecedented kind of conversation or you know a bit like two people coming into a pub don't necessarily each other but they they take to the banter right they have funning with at the expense of and with each other um which we always did but now we have these new kind of new ways of doing it essentially through through um adapting these visual media and i think that is a profound change because i don't think conversation was ever like that in that way before fascinating um, and it reminds me that we have to talk about memes. <laughs> um, so I know everyone probably, it's a term my dad is increasingly using now, so it must have, uh, it must have sort of, it must be out there. Um, but I'm sure we all have a common sense idea of what they are, but maybe could you say a little bit about, about how you understand them and how they work in internet life? And then I might invite Rebecca in to talk about some other kind of ethical aspects of online life. Yeah, memes, I think, are fascinating. Because we actually have a, a theory of the meme, if you like. We call memes the um, the moral police of the internet. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you look at the, the content of memes and how they're sent, they usually express values. That is to say, um, quite often they're making fun of something, fun of the other gender, fun of politicians, um, or actually in some of our sites, like in India, they're often blessings actually things which uh, in the morning you want to send blessings to other Hindus or whatever it is, and you use kind of memes to do it. And they're very effective in this way, because even if you're you know, not particularly confident or articulate or whatever, you're not gonna say very much about what your values are, um, actually simply because somebody sent you a meme and you send it on, um, you are then saying, well, I actually kind of support those comments on gender um, and um, and not those. And it's a very kind of easy way of doing that. Now, one of the, the things about these new developments is they're very fast. They're changing all the time. And what's interesting then is how come when something is so movable, um, three months, it's another kind of media, within a very short time, everybody seems to know what is okay, the appropriate way to use these things and the inappropriate way to use things. What creates what we call the normative? How does it, how does it, how does it come back to, into being? And if you put these two things together, what you realize is that memes are a very good way of actually saying, yeah, this is kind of okay, that's not okay. Um, and the way, you know, you know, do I get likes or do I not get likes tells you something about what people think about something that you have shared. So the moral police of the internet is actually a, a way that in a sense people are taking to this new area and using a device to actually, in a sense, consensually or, or in opposition to others, create a sense of, of, of what the world, both you know, how you should post, et cetera, but also their general morality, moral stance on whatever else is on class or whatever else is going on in the world. Um, what do you actually think about it? So although they look like a, like a, a nothing, as it were, um, actually, we, we would argue they have quite really quite interesting consequences, um, including consequences for the development of these media themselves. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I can think about nice examples as well of where you, you don't exactly have a fully articulated sense of what you want to say in a certain topic, but you might like to signal sort of, you know, disagreement or, in, you know, enthusiastic support. And, you know, maybe you find a nicely curated image that does it well for you without having to get into the tangle of words. All right, so Rebecca, you've written on many aspects of online culture and the philosophical issues that attend them. Um, so one thought that, that immediately comes to mind is that there are parts of internet culture that might demand we do new types of ethical thinking. I was wondering what other, I mean, maybe based on what the others have said as well, what sort of um, ethical issues might arise online that we need to, need to sort of build new theories for? 
yeah, I mean, this is this is fascinating um, what we've heard so far. Um, I mean, I so I'm interested in um, sort of applied parts of the philosophy of language. So things like um, you know the the nature and ethics of swearing, um, passive aggression, and sort of other forms of indirect uh, communication. And one thing that comes out of this is um, how much of our communication is unspoken and how much of what we say when we are speaking is sort of not literal. So if you think about the way that swearing is used among friends versus the people you're angry with, um, you know, you can, you can swear without actually asserting something, but you're sort of conveying a mood um, or, you know, an attitude, um, it's a it's a form of emotional expression and, and a lot of that involves sort of body language as well you know there's a lot of unspoken things going on um and something like passive aggression as well it's it's all about sort of what we're communicating beneath the surface so we're saying one thing but we're communicating something else through the body language the, the tone in which we speak and so on um and one interesting thing is how that changes when we move online um i mean it's we, we've long heard people saying things like it's it's so difficult to get the tone right when you're emailing somebody. You know, you sort of you you send somebody an email that you thought was friendly and they um, and then it turns out they thought you were being very curt or you know, sort of something like this. So incredibly relatable. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so you know, it's uh, we, we're sort of used to sort of, you know, as, as we've been hearing so far, it's 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 fascinating just the ways in which especially young people, which makes me sound super old, but, um, you know, sort of the, the new ways of communicating and relating to people online. Um, you know, and I've seen this in my own kids. I've got a, um, a year seven who sort of arrives home from school and then she's sort of straight on her phone uh, talking to her friends. And, you know, when we when they do that, you know, while it opens a lot of doors for them, you know, that she has conversation, you know, once when I was at school, once I'd finished school and got off the bus, that was it. I didn't speak to anyone who wasn't in my family until I got it, I got to school the next morning. But, you know, for, for school age kids now that it's just sort of ongoing. So, so in one sense, they can be, you know, they, they have a lot their their interactions with each other are a lot richer. But also in, in some ways, it is an impoverished mode of communicating. Um I mean, especially as, you know, sort of initially this was sort of textual. So, you know, it was sort of, I guess, SMSs in the in the old days, wasn't it? And then um, just so it's a really fascinating sort of hearing um, so far about the ways that it's all become, you know, communications become more visual. Um, and it's about sort of enabling people to tell stories and express themselves and communicate without actually using words. And, and one interesting thing to think about here, I think, is... Um, how our online communicate uh, our methods of communicating online are replacing the norms that we've grown up with or you know that you've grown up with if you're over 25 say um so you know the the, the reliance we've made on um what we don't say to people when we communicate you know what goes on other than our words our body language our tone of voice the context um you know, the norms in a particular environment. So you'd sort of speak to people in a different way at work compared to at home. Um, you'd speak to people differently if you're in a group of close intimate friends versus strangers and so on. You, you lose a lot of that when you're communicating online. Um, and that, I think, you know, is, is being replaced gradually and in such a way that you know, can, can we expect people to have a grasp of it? I mean, if you think about something like um, the norms around when you like somebody's post on Facebook, I know like uh, sort of teenagers don't use Facebook <laughs> today, so it's kind of too old. But, you know, it's um, if you accidentally like the, the Facebook post of, you know, an ex-partner, and you know it's, it's it's a photo from years ago it's kind of horrifying right? it's like oh my god they know i've been looking through their photos how embarrassing so it's like you know we're kind of gradually building up these sort of expectations and these norms about um when you can interact with people in a certain way um but it's kind of happening very slowly and i think um so in you know an interesting set of ish ethical issues arises around 
um, when it's when it's okay for us to interact with a particular person or a particular group of people. Um, and you see this, I think, on uh, on Twitter. Um, so whereas something like Facebook, you can sort of build up, you can you can choose your audience a lot more easily. You can share something with just friends or, or a certain group. And, and on Twitter, it's sort of a lot more public or it's a lot more binary. You know, you either have a private account or, or you don't. Um, and so you get these sort of interactions where you, you might have a sort of small group of people having a conversation made up of tweets. Um, and then somebody else comes in and is a stranger and is sort of quite aggressive. Um, and then there's this sort of set of questions of, you know, what, how, how reasonable are you to expect somebody to butt out of your conversation if it's in, um, you know, if, it, if it's on somewhere like Twitter? And, you know, you sometimes see these conversations where people are sort of saying things like, um, you know, do you mind who asked you? And then the person who butted in and say, well, you know, you're kind of having this conversation in the public place. Why, why are you doing it if you don't expect people to, to, to join in? And if that were happening in real life, we'd have a set of norms around body language and how close we're standing to people and where we are that determine how acceptable it is for people to join in or not join in. So, you know, if you see a group of four people uh, sitting together at a table in a restaurant, you know, there's a sense in which they're in a public place, but it's still unacceptable uh, to just to kind of go up and sit down with them and join into their conversation, right? That would be sort of really intrusive. Totally. And actually, speaking of intruding on conversations, I would like to remind the audience that they may do the most polite possible version of intruding by using the Q&A and asking a question. Um, but yeah, you're so right. I mean, there are just these, these ways in which group dynamics exist online that are just very different from the offline car. That's like exactly as you say, it might be possible if somebody came over and said something really appropriate in the midst of a kind of genial conversation at a conference or something to be like, whoa, man, that was that was not appropriate. You know, whereas like, it just seems like you can, it, there's a you know maybe you can only go hell for leather or say nothing at all on on Twitter particularly. Um, and do, do you see people sort of compensating for this or finding new ways of kind of giving some of that subtext? Well, there are so, so you know there's there's sort of new terms spring, springing up. Um, I mean, new relatively speaking. So um, you know the term sea sea lining, for example, which is sort of used to describe I suppose a particular type of troll who just uh, has a sort of superficially polite but is sort of persistently asking questions in a way that derails the conversation um, now without that term it's hard to articulate what's wrong with that but you know once we have the term and it's and people you know there's there's a reasonable level of understanding of what it means then sort of labeling somebody a sea line can can be a sort of effective way of responding then. Uh, and it's interesting also sort of um, uh, what Danny was saying about uh, about memes, that you, you can sort of sometimes see people shut down by a particular meme. Um, so that, you know, even, I guess there's, there's a lot of the time there's this sort of, um, this dilemma about, well, we kind of don't want to interact with, we want this person to go away, but we don't want to kind of derail our conversation by having to interact with them. Um, and so sort of memes can be a sort of conversation stopper, I guess, a way of doing that. And I guess, you know, sort of more passive aggressively, just the sort of tr more traditional ways of reacting to somebody like a, a like on their post is kind of like, yes, very good. Like a pat on the head, <laughs> it's a very interesting go away now. So it's just interesting to see, you know, sort of watching this in real time, sort of how the, the sort of impoverished, method of communication online when we kind of lose so much of what we see when we interact face to face is just gradually being replaced by the tools that we do have available in the online format whether it's you know sort of likes or sort of using inventing new concepts and labels for people or, or sort of memes or or whatever that's, I mean it's, it's reminding me as well of something that Danny was saying about the different cultures that kind of that emerged I'm just thinking specifically of philosophy Twitter which is famously very active and can be quite <laughs> argumentative but I, it's it's such a frequent experience for me especially in maths Twitter <laughs> to have a joke I make about a mathematical thing then explained to me a few times over and over underneath that like I have to put like six 
laughing emojis I feel in any joke about a mathematical concept as a way of signaling like this is a joke don't come and tell me how infinitesimals <laughs> work now but it is I mean I feel like I see that as a real species of, of what you're both talking about yeah and that, that's kind of the, there's the term reply guy now for that sort of thing isn't it <laughs> so it's like you know there's a term for every sort of undesirable form of interacting with people online and I'm just wondering now, just to try and connect to some of the themes in, in everyone, in what everyone has been saying, like we've talked a little bit about how easy it is to sort of misinterpret. Um, but I, I'm wondering, sort of, do we find that the language people are using is really is really shifting in a way to try and make things more intentional? Or I don't know, is there any sort of linguistic shifts you've seen as a philosopher of language that sort of respond to these kind of changes in the way we're conversing? Yeah, I mean, I have, I, I think somebody with, you know, the sort of linguistic background is going to be able to say more interesting things than I can. But I think even things like, you know, whether you're using, you know, sort of obviously you have sort of abbreviations for, for certain things have been around for quite a long time. But but even things like the punctuation that people use or, or the um, whether you use capitals or not, sometimes that can sort of convey a mood um, and maybe in a way that, um if you're not, unless you're a member of a certain in-group, it, it just, it's impenetrable. You should know, think, what, why can't these people, or, you know, sort of um, when people used to talk about text speak, I guess that's quite, uh, that's quite sort of ancient now, relatively. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's sort of like, you know, um, the, the people that use that term are sort of using it sort of disapprovingly and sort of why can't these people express themselves properly and what's happening to our language and so on, but that it sort of conveys a particular mood. So, so it's almost like, you know, sort of you would have a certain, certain terms that you use with an in-group. Um, but anyway, this is kind of like, you know, I feel like I'm sort of commenting on this in an amateurish way. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. at all it reminds me that when I was you know, I'm really showing my age now a teenager a text cost 13p so I mean some of it was trying to sound cool and new but some of it was just I had a lot to say and I didn't have much much credit left yeah. but yeah. um I wanted to return to to Alex for a second and then my main theme in the last few minutes would just be to think about the way the self is represented and I know Danny has ideas on this as well but uh authenticity as well Alex seems to come into your work and how stories have become a kind of vehicle for for people to be encouraged in, in expressing their authenticity um, could you say a little bit about that and maybe the sort of impact on on truth and credibility uh yeah uh, can i just can i just say something you just have uh, been fascinated by what okay. rebecca was saying and one of the things on the linguistic level that that we note in exchanges, for instance, where you see aggressive language being used, or equally where you see lots of positive, uh, appreciative language being used, uh, because you have all these multi-party type of contributions that Rebecca was talking about, uh, something that we see is clustering, as it were, of, of specific language used, uh, which I kind of call ritual ritual appreciation uh, clusterings or ritual insult clusterings. And what happens in those cases is, I've seen it, for instance, um, I've shown that this happens in comments and selfies or in comments on YouTube videos. Uh, and there is a very closed pool of either positive adjectives or very negative adjectives and insults and emojis that are being used. It's almost as if in that town hall of, of contributions, uh, different participants kind of imitate one another uh, in terms of the language they use, but also they kind of upgrade on the language that has been used. That's why we can see escalation really quickly. So for instance, you see if, if one comment has five exclamation marks and, and, and two emojis, then chances are that a subsequent comment will go more on that. We'll have more emojis, more exclamation marks. And this is and, and this is quite interesting in terms of this ritualized kind of conventionalized element. And, and maybe it's about a performative again. I think Rebecca, you touched on this as well, that you know, this performative aspect that we see online that, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, you know, it, it we don't do flaming or, or bullying online is not real and it doesn't have real consequences. But I'm saying that as analysts, I think we should be looking 
to the connections between the modes of participation that the platforms themselves afford and the types of contributions that these really are conducive to. I wasn't supposed to talk about that at all, <laughs> was I? <laughs> I mean, please, I mean, talk about whatever you like. <laughs> So, what was I supposed to talk about? Well, I was something, wondering about authenticity because one of the things you just suggested. Yeah. Yeah, something on authenticity. Yeah, you see, I, I, again, you know, stories and authenticity seem to kind of go together, hand in hand together uh, right now online. Uh, they are kind of buzzwords uh, uh, where, it, particularly in brand storytelling, you know, telling a story about a product. It's very much seen as a vehicle for authenticity and as a way for brands to connect with their customers. Um, and I think the things that I talked about before, you know, what is conducive to authenticity through stories is this idea of, oh, you tell your story in the here and now, you, you, it's ephemeral, it's spontaneous, and it's not rehearsed. Obviously, these are tropes, because we can imagine storytellers kind of strategizing that, not necessarily showing us their entirely truthful selves. But it's about, um, also, it's about being um, really relatable and ordinary through your stories, mining the banal, um, and, 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 and truth then kind of becomes not something that has maybe, that is connected with say the accuracy of events, events, but it's more about the believable and relatable storytellers. And in fact, if you look at Instagram and how they launched stories, they launched stories as a resource for doing imperfect sharing. They called it imperfect sharing. That was a bit of a way in which they were trying to remedy the backlash against selfies and putting out their glossy, pristine lives. We saw that on Facebook happening in the early days. So stories kind of from the word go were very much introduced as um, the, the, the vehicle uh, through which you, you can do uh, authenticity. Now, obviously I'm not a philosopher, but what this intimate engineered, if you want, because it's very technological. Again, it's a directive link between stories and, and, and authenticity in the sense of truth. What it does to notions of truth, that's kind of interesting to me and there's much scope for looking into that because um, uh, it, it, it's, it's about truth being thought of increasingly, not as evidence maybe, or I don't know, as hard facts or as science, but as personal experience and personality attributes. And, it, it, and that gets really instrumentalized by various storytellers. We've seen politicians strategizing around this type of truth and misinforming. Um, We've seen influencers, we've seen advertising companies um, co-opting this type of uh, storytelling and authenticity. I mean, I don't want to be too pessimistic because having said that, uh, we can also see um, authenticity through stories being harnessed and mobilized for digital activism as well. So it's not all bad, right? We shouldn't be saying that it's all bad. <laughs> No, but there is, I mean, I know what you're saying. There is some sort of implied urgency sometimes in the stories that when I see this in, in the kind of motherhood influencer sphere a lot as well, like suddenly yeah. you're seeing stories which are kind of mundane tips, let's say, from just them going through their day. And then suddenly it's a product placement and it feels like, yeah, no, yeah. I'm busy in my life, but I just had to tell you guys about this. You know, there's something that's supposed yeah. to read, I suppose, as much more sort of impulsive and that they must tell you about this great thing. I can see how advertisers would hit upon all of these things you've mentioned about the here and now and the visual. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, was I mean, do, do you, uh, Rebecca, Danny, do you have any thoughts on this kind of way in which, you know, people are sort of manipulating maybe um, yeah, certain I, formats? What I'd like to do for CK is, is take this issue of authenticity, but in a somewhat different mode, because I sort of listened to all three of us discussing all these changes and, and the anxieties we have about, as it were, what is being lost. And I think that the problem is that um, that 
tends to lead to a kind of nostalgia, almost a kind of romantic idea of what the, the previous forms of communication, pre-digital um, conversation, as though that was the more authentic form. And actually, I think we sort of forget that if you turn to non-digital, um, it isn't at all. I mean, it, it's, it's extremely performative. It's essentially a series of platforms, that is to say, the, the way you talk in the workplace was a platform. The way you uh, talk in a pub was a platform. The way you talk around the family dinner table was a platform. Um, all of them were highly constrained. Um, no, um, no way were you necessarily sort of telling it as it in some ways is. They were uh, all essentially cultural forms with their with their specifics. And as I said, in the Japanese case, often, you know, hegged around. So they were not at all free so um and i think the problem is when we're looking at the new we tend to think of it often in terms of the loss of something but actually um that's problematic if we regard the tradition as authentic um i don't think that's a useful way of looking at it at all and it, it comes to a, a sort of a more philosophical point if you like that i wanted to make which is i think that um we're, we're seeing it almost as though it's a loss in some quality of being human um, some vital element of what it was that we're now more superficial or um, we're not, or, or dishonest or, or whatever. And I think that that's because we have a rather conservative view, actually, of what it is to be human. Um, the, it's, being human is all the things that human beings have been up till now. When actually, um, I think if we're, if we're going to, these are going to change, they're going to keep changing all the time. If we don't want to every time it comes to have a kind of lament of that kind, then maybe we just need a different way of understanding what it is to be human, which includes a sort of latency, the idea that, you know, yes, humans can't fly. Oh, wait a minute, we have airplanes, we can fly. So being human should, I think, include all the things we are ever going to be, um, thanks to the new technological capacities as they arise. And then it's not a case of, you know, is the, the, it, was it more authentic and is it now less authentic? It's just constantly shifting ways of being human. Okay, so we just, yeah, we can, we can cope with these things better if we see it as sort of shifting aspects of humanity rather than just a sort of uh, and a negation of what was authentic to us originally or something by understanding ourselves as kind of historical things. Rebecca, do you have any sort of thoughts on this as, as our philosopher? Yeah, um, I, I, agree with, I agree with Danny. Um, I wrote a, a, a book chapter a, a couple of years ago about whether Facebook is good or bad for friendship. Um, and and I, I took very much the line that, that, that Danny is taking. You know, there's this temptation to look back on what how things have been up until now as the benchmark and then to view changes as a loss. So I was sort of trying to imagine a situation where imagine if we'd always had social media and and suddenly we and suddenly we didn't have it and we could only interact face to face or by the phone you know traditional phone um or uh, or by writing letters and, and sort of would we would we view this as a gain and i really don't think we would i think that um social media has given especially certain sorts of people ways of relating to others that they wouldn't have had before so so you know sort of people who with high levels of social anxiety or people who live in geographically remote areas or, or people who are just, you know, sort of unable to afford the expenses that often goes around with socialising face to face, like buying dinner or drinks in a pub. And just also people that, you know, sort of so somebody with a particular sort of struggle in life, you know, maybe sort of suffering from a particular medical condition or a certain set of beliefs might have had trouble connecting with people with similar interests if they were just confined to their village. Um, but through online interactions and social media, they can connect with people sort of around the world who who they share certain similarities with. And I think, you know, if we'd always had that and then suddenly we lost it, that that we, we'd be viewing that as a loss, um, which should tell us something, you know, that, that uh, it's the change that we are sometimes resistant to and and I think you know if you've been grown up and if you've been growing up and you have um 
you know, sort of found your found your social wings in an environment where um, where people weren't reacting, uh, interacting online very much, then any change from that is going to be strange for you, unless you're the sort of person who just kind of really embraces change. Um, so, so I think really it has to do with with change rather than um, the the nature of the, the form of interaction itself. That people just don't like change. I'd love to read that article. I mean, it sounds fantastic. And it's so true what you say. I mean, you and I are both knitters. So, but even just, the, I mean, that's such a, in many ways, <laughs> I mean, I think your jumper is a hand in as well as it, but um, the the community that lives there for people knitting. And it's, it's this funny intergenerational thing where it's like most of us were taught to knit by our grannies. And, you know, there's this very lo-fi kind of sense to it, but it's wonderful now that there's this thriving community, which, you know, is online, includes people of vastly different ages, geographical, any you know, of the stars of the show are these sort of 70 year old Midwestern ladies. I mean, it's just, it's a really, really nice thing. And I would be bereft without it. Uh, and I suppose another thing that you mentioned is sort of how, uh, or that it, that it reminds me of is how, you know, online and social media were such a sort of digital, you know, life raft for people during COVID. I mean, there are many people in my life, at least, who I really would have worried about if I didn't have some of the resources that we have to stay in touch with people now because of things like, you know, WhatsApp or, or other kind of sort of minimally technologically demanding apps. Um, but so at this point, I might move to Q&A yeah. from some of the audience. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Can, I, can we just say something? Because I don't want to go down as the pessimist okay. <laughs> amongst us. Uh, just very quickly, I don't see authenticity ontologically. I see authenticity as a prevalent discourse on social media construction. And I think it's not about lamenting, but it's about unpicking the what's and why's. Uh, and calibrating the role of technologies in essentially, as Rebecca said, reconfigurations of self-identity, communication modalities such as storytelling. That's all. I felt I had to say this. No, I feel I felt there was lots of balance there, but it, I guess there has to be something authentic there, right, to, for, for people to be taking advantage of in a sense. Do you know what I mean? It has to have that facility for doing something valuable like showing people in the moment and and here for there to be a sort of yeah. reason but for it's somebody. about but it's about situated historical technologically afforded definitions and conceptualizations of authenticity right okay so to the q a then so one question from facebook here asks could the speakers comment on how communication about social movements is influenced by social media or is it the other way around has communication on social media been influenced by social movements I think the only thing I would say is, I mean, it's not my area of expertise, uh, but there are people like Eugene Morisov, who I think have written excellently about exactly this topic. Um, because on the one hand, you can say, oh, you know, you get this clicktivism. It's just so easy to click on something and you think you've, you know, you've done your political work, whereas you know, people like me, who are members of political parties, go door to door and do all that hard work, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so there's a sort of easy activism. Um, but on the other hand, there has been uh, tremendous possibilities arising out of people coming together online, which then um, you have the problem that governments have the ability to track them and actually repress them. So if you look at Morozov's work on things like the Arab spring and what happened afterwards. Um, it's actually a very complex image of kind of cat and mouse, where on the one hand, it facilitates new kinds of political activism, but it's then um, it also facilitates the repression um, of that of that activism. Um, and that seems to be an ongoing uh, ongoing cycle, really. Uh, but I think he's really the expert. I mean, the only thing I would say is actually um, we, we, we there was so much in the media about the political elements of, of these things and what came out of our work, because we try and just sit there, we just look at what goes through people's um, accounts, as it were. And one of the things that was very striking in a number of our studies was actually how little of it is political. Um, you know, the problem is if you look for the politics, it seems all about that. But if you do what we do, and you'll sit there and, you know, here is somebody sitting next to you and or the neighbour, etc. How much actually is political within their general social media usage, etc., etc.? It's, I think, generally far less than you would ever think from looking at the media. Great, thanks. Does anyone else want to join in or should I move on? 
Okay, here's one for Rebecca. So Rebecca, could valuing modern media against face-to-face be a category mistake in relation to comparing it with writing and painting? Mm, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I think, um, yeah, so, so so the, maybe I'll explain, so category mistake is a term for philosophy. So um, maybe it's worth just sort of saying what it means, um, that you make a category mistake when you describe, when you apply some term to a concept um, that it, it really isn't designed to be applied for. So, so asking something like, what colour is the number three? Uh, which is complicated, so I know some people do see, <laughs> associate numbers with colours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, so I think, you know, sort of uh, the, the, the question I understand as, you know, are these so different that it doesn't make sense to compare them? And I, w- I was thinking about, I saw the question um, a few minutes ago, I was thinking about it, but... Um, I don't think so. I think that um, so uh, that the the modern media, as the person has called it, um, and face to face communication are, are are both ways in which we communicate. Um, whether that's sort of sharing information or moods or just sort of connecting with other people, um, they're both ways in which we can do that. And and I think that. Uh, that, that it's then reasonable to ask, well, in what ways are they similar and different? And are there particular ways of connecting with people that are better facilitated by one rather than the other? Do we lose certain things by communicating, say, face to face versus online? So I think there are, you know, there is there is a useful set of comparisons to be made. Um, I mean, the, uh, the, the the person asking the questions has also sort of given us an example, you know, sort of comparing um comparing it comparing i guess modern media with writing and painting um i mean i think that that's that's kind of a more abstract communicate uh, comparison i guess because we wouldn't or i'm not aware of <laughs> sort of anyone who think uh instead of expressing this thing i want to express by social media i'll express it by um painting something but you know you could do that so i think that there's still a there's still a, a a meaningful set of questions to ask about you know what we can communicate via these various media and and how we can do that thanks rebecca um here's one maybe probably likely directed at alex so this is from shruti can we say that the story feature on linkedin hasn't picked up in comparison to other platforms because linkedin is seen as a textual intellectual platform rather than a visual platform why aren't people who have presence on linkedin and instagram posting stories as frequently on instagram or sorry on linkedin as on instagram sorry for butchering the end of your question Shruti. yeah sure i mean look communication purposes and functions of platforms and platforms by now have histories and they have personalities. We, we know what we, we normally do uh, on each platform. And also uh, platforms are designed with intended users in mind and with intended projects for those users in mind. And those things are very much linked, <laughs> pun, pun intentional, with what facilities are offered. Uh, I think that it also, so, so the, the fact that, it, you know, Instagram, for instance, Facebook, uh, historically, because Facebook is changing, as we know, all the time, um, Snapchat, historically, were so-called ego-centered platforms, where you were kind of putting yourself up and your life for scrutiny, while LinkedIn has been exactly a more professional platform, uh, definitely has something to do with the feature of stories but it's also about how advertising works on these platforms and LinkedIn is is less of a space for brand advertising than in other platforms where storytelling as I said has been co-opted so that you know it 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 gives data of, of ours so that it kind of monetizes and quantifies our data so I think these two are some of the main reasons as to why we haven't seen yet, because it's widely replicated, this feature of stories, you know, uh, stay tuned. We haven't seen it yet uh, on LinkedIn kind of take off. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there's another question here from Caitlin, who says, to, or who asks, to what extent do show reels or the best bits um, that people share on social media embed and even distort cultural norms? For example, the pressure to be a homeowner in the UK because you see friends posting with keys or posing with keys. (laughs) 
Should we just have a go? I, I wasn't sure who, who the question was to. I can have I, anyone. Yeah. About it. Um, yeah. I mean, I think people talk about this, don't they? That there's this sort of um, almost a cliche about uh, Instagram life. Um, I was having a I was having a text conversation with a friend last week who was camp who was glamping um, with her family, and she was sort of complaining that it was um, it, it wasn't really living up to how she's envisaged it. And I said, "Oh yeah, it sounds like you wanted the Instagram version of glamping, right? Not not the way it really is." And you know, we we kind of all know that. Um, you know, people kind of set up a shot when they're photographing their dinner, sort of make that the light, the lighting is all correct. And then, you know, sort of people post the holidays and you get a very sort of filtered version of, um, of what people's lives are like. Um, but sort of while people know it's ridiculous, it also seems that there's this pressure to live up to it as well. Um, I, I was listening to an interview, which I sort of can't remember who it was, I'm afraid, but um, a sort of a doctor talking about um, this pressure from Instagram to create meals that are visually appealing. Um, you know, so people actually feel under pressure to eat sort of not only healthily, but in a way that is kind of photo, you know, photogenic as well. <laughs> and how, you know, ridiculous that is because, um, you know, some, some of us barely have time to make a meal. As you saw at the beginning of this call, <laughs> I, sort of, I, I was making dinner at the same time as uh, joining this call. Um, yeah, I mean, there is this pressure and it's sort of, it's, it's a nice example of how, well, sort of cognitive dissonance, I guess, that, that we sort of, we laugh about, isn't it ridiculous, the sort of stuff that people post. I'm talking about Instagram rather than the sort of show reels or the best bits because I'm um, too old and I don't really understand what they are. Um, but, you know, we, we recognise that it's ridiculous and not representative of reality, but at the same time, we kind of feel like we have to live up to it. Can I just add a bit of cultural difference here? When we started our work, we were working in two low-income communities, one in, in Chile and one in Brazil. And in the Brazilians, a squatting community, and it, there was a sense that, you know, you would never post your life as it is, you know, half-built kind of bits. You would always post, if you could, next to a swimming pool, next to a gym, etc. And that was, you know, we took that and thought, well, obviously, that's what you would do. Except that when we looked at the Chilean, again, low-income, their attitude was, what, the, what are you talking about? We know who you are. You can't post something that isn't the case. Um, everybody knows that you don't, you're not next to a swimming pool, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the, the point that is being made, as it were, would be would vary considerably depending on the kind of values and etiquettes that arise anew with the particular platforms. And you can get completely opposite views about whether this is or is not appropriate for the same given, given platform. And, and that was just a case in point. OK, so there's this assumption that everybody is trying to project something better, but often there's lots of sort of subtextual or cultural reasons why that just doesn't make sense for, for certain kinds of posting. OK, so one final question maybe um, for Danny. So how did you differentiate between a Western fear of getting less attractive uh, and women showing their new beauty and maturity? So maybe it's kind of a methodological question about how to well, I, I, be I confident about it. I think it was a question probably that came out of the, the mother examples. And actually, yeah. in, in fact, it wasn't about that at all. It was, it was actually not about the fear of um, looking older. It was about um, how much you want to associate yourself specifically with being a mother in the world. But you have raised something, I think, really interesting there, which came out a bit where, again, we were talking about authenticity earlier on. Um, I work a lot with, with older people now, and um, a lot of people um, will post things that don't look an awful lot like they are today. Can we admit that? You know, you, your photo online is possibly a few years kind of behind what you are now. But when I discuss this with people, what they're saying to me, or not always, but very often is this, they're saying, the thing is, I want to post who I am, what I look like, as it were. But the body doesn't represent that at all. Um, I've got all these crinkles and the grey, et cetera, et cetera. But that isn't me. It's my body betraying what I actually am and how I feel and the age I really am. When I put that thing online, that's not denying who I am. It's finally, I've got a means of actually authentically expressing who I actually am. 
Um, so I think this question of, you know, how, how, how we deal with, in a sense, getting older and the possibilities then of representation, again, shows that, you know, we don't want to be nostalgic about the body happening to represent us as though that was more real. Because frankly, as most people get older, that is simply not the way they think about their relationship to their own body. Okay, thank you so much for, um, for those thoughts. Um, I'm afraid we are at time now, so um, all that remains is to thank um, thank you, all three of you, for, for so kindly agreeing to speak to us. And I have very much enjoyed this very modern conversation with all of you. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you so much to everyone who joined us and for the excellent questions. Um, it's been a real pleasure to, to forward them on. Uh, OK, so good evening and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.